Hey, check this out, Mark. You're incredible. Mark, give it up for Mark Sweater. Woo! Yeah. Just you, buddy. You can pay me later. That's right. Hey, check this out, man. You would think, man, listen to this. You would think that you, these people would have been humbled. I mean, just a little bit, Kevin. After one-fourth of the earth was totally annihilated by war, pestilence, famine, even a horrible wild beast attack. But no, not these people. And then you would at least expect uh, just a small, man, just a small change of direction uh, after the earth was totally burned up and the oceans totally destroyed. But no, not these people. And then, then you would think even after another one-third of the earth's population was totally annihilated, a horde of demons was sent to torture these people again and again and again, but they still wouldn't turn. In fact, listen to this, it got so bad, man. These proud, arrogant, foolish people decided to do one of the dumbest things ever. They decided to take on God. <laughs> you talk about stupid. The kings of the earth and the armies that were still left alive at this point, they actually gathered together and took one last stand against God. Get this, Steve. They, they, they pointed their guns. They aimed their weapons. They, they, they even stood in total defiance when all of a sudden, the Lamb of God ripped open the sky literally and millions and millions and millions of angels were unleashed upon these rebels. <laughs> this was no battle. Are you kidding me? It was a bloodbath. The wrath of God at this point had been totally poured out and, and the defeat of these people was utterly swift. Listen, their leaders were thrown actually alive into the lake of fire. And get this, the rest of them were, listen, were squashed and popped just like giant grapes in a wine press. The slaughter was so great, Carrie, that their blood flowed as high as four feet deep for 180 miles. So much for a fight with God. The book is Revelation. The judgment, of course, is the Battle of Armageddon. Not much of a battle, is it? But folks, I don't know. Maybe it's just me and Chuck today. And Ed, I'll throw you in there too, buddy. But how many guys would say, and you would readily agree, man, that picking a fight with God is one of the dumbest things you could ever do? I mean, you talk about sin, you talk about rebellion, and here's the point. What was God doing when the whole world was pointing their guns at him? What was he doing? Was he freaking out? Was he wigging out? Was he all totally worried? Oh, please, oh, oh. Are you kidding me, folks? What the sex? He wasn't worried one teensy weensy bit. Hello, oh, he's God. He judged those people and he annihilated them just like that. And so here's the obvious point. You would think, hello, that people would stand up and take notice when God warns them of that future judgment. That's the end of the seven year tribulation in the battle of Armageddon, right? You would think that people would rightly conclude, hey man, I better get right with God so I don't suffer that coming judgment from God, right? But folks, what have we been seeing for several weeks now? That's no longer the case. The Bible once again was right when they said in the last days scoffers would come. People are not just having a hard time believing in God, but man, if there's one thing they refuse to believe in, it's in that future coming judgment of God. Therefore, out of love, out of concern, it's only the natural response. In order to help these scoffing people to hopefully become smarter people, we're going to continue, that's right, in our study, the witness of creation. The witness of creation. And folks, what we've been seeing, if you recall, is we're looking at, taking a look at five different evidences from God. Talk about merciful, that he's given us to show us, folks, it's not just that he's real. Hey, that's great. Praise God, we're not flying around the universe and we're going to explode. God's in control. But here's the point, that we really can have an intimate, beautiful, personal relationship with the creator of the universe. Absolutely mind-blowing. That's the whole point of him showing us this stuff, folks. And we've already seen the first evidence that he's given us, showing us this amazing truth, folks, is the evidence of an intelligent creation. The second evidence, if you recall, was the evidence of a young creation. The third evidence was the evidence of a special creation. And if you've been here the whole time, hello, we've seen so far the last seven times, folks. The fourth evidence is the evidence of a judge creation. And you talk about merciful, what we've been seeing, folks, is there really was a worldwide flood. Listen, here's the whole point. What was that about? Just a boat trip, a pleasure cruise? No. It was a time when God judged this world because of sin, just like today. And he wiped out the whole planet except for eight people. Not just because the Bible says so. That should be good enough. But as we've been dealing with the facts, folks, the evidence. And we saw the evidence the last two times. The evidence of a gargantuan boat says so. Hello. And what we saw there, folks, if you recall, was the evidence of the findings of Noah's Ark throughout history. Even before the time when Jesus walked this earth in his earthly ministry to the cross. 
We saw it was the feasibility of Noah's Ark. We saw it was the further questions surrounding the Ark that showed us beyond the shadow of a doubt, folks. Contrary to what skeptics say, that there really was a guy named Noah who really built a big old giant boat, who really survived on that thing with his family and the animals during a literal worldwide flood. That is, if you're honest, with the facts. But you talk about merciful God. I mean, how much does he have to do? No wonder the judgment to come is the manner in which it is. The seventh evidence of a judge creation, folks, is the evidence of a glorious civilization. A world that was at one time, but then was totally wiped out. You would think if there was a whole world, a whole civilization, a whole existence of people that existed at one time that was perished in a flood, we'd find some evidence of that glorious civilization, don't you? Hey, Joanne, you're on the ball. That's why we're going to not take my word for it. Let's listen to God. Let's look and see what kind of a civilization that was. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 through 22. Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. Now, as we turn there, folks, and uh, find the dictionary, just flip it over, start all over. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 through 22. Now, as we turn there, pay attention to what our society says. Evolution virtually has everything totally backwards what God says. This is the account of the history and the beginnings of mankind on the earth. This is the whole point here, folks. And we're going to see what kind of civilization it was. Notice as we read through this, it has nothing to do, and it never mentions the word caveman. It has nothing to do with Geico or insurance or anything like that. And those guys trying to bowl and would just leave me alone, etc. blah, blah, blah. It has nothing to do with ape-like creatures dragging their knuckles on the ground. It's exactly the opposite of what scripture has to say. Shocker. Let's take a look at the true beginnings of mankind. What kind of a civilization was it? A bunch of apes? Ooh, with fire? You like that one? I'll, we'll, get the video. You can back it up and play it five times. <laughs> Cheap entertainment, man. Who needs cable? Okay. Let's take a look at that civilization. Okay. Genesis chapter 4. Let's read verses 16. Now, this is, of course, the context here is after the fall of man, unfortunately. Okay. And then comes the first sin. Uh, this never happens to us. Blame. Okay. Then the next one, apparently, down the pike was murder. And Cain killed his brother Abel, and then he was banished from the Garden of Eden. Here's what he goes and does. The very beginnings of civilization. Let's take a look at the text there. Here's what he says. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, verse 16, and he lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And, and, and Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. And Cain was what? <laughs> out of the blue, what's he doing, man? He's building a city. And he named it after his son Enoch. And then to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mahujael. And Mahujael was the father of Methujael, and Methujael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women. One was named Ada, and the other was Zillah. And Ada gave birth to Jabal. Listen, out of the blue, he's the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. He's got a brother. His name's Jubal. Listen, he's the father, out of the blue, who plays the harp and the flute. <laughs> and then Zillah, she also has a son. His name's Tubalcane, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron and uh, honorable mention, apparently. Tubalcane's sister was Nama. Okay? Folks, how many times do we read through that text and we don't have any clue of what's going on, how backwards our society really has it? According to our text, the Bible clearly says that the pre-flood civilization, listen, was not made up. Did you see it anywhere there in the southern hidden Hebrew? It was not made up of some dumb ape-like creatures who were living in caves, dragging their knuckles on the ground. Right? Did anybody see that there in the text? No, not at all. And, and, and folks, what it did say is they weren't living in caves. What were they doing? They were building cities, right? Out of the blue is the whole point. Out of the blue. People, on my best day, I couldn't even build a shed, let alone a city. <laughs> out of the blue. But that's not all. What else is just hidden there? Just in a few verses. What else did it say? One guy named Jubal gets up one day and he decides to invent music and the instruments to play. Not play music, to invent music and the instruments to play it with out of the blue. That's pretty smart. Another guy named Tubal Cain, he decides, what do you want to do today? I don't know. Uh, let's invent metallurgy and let's start making complex alloys, separating them from various mineral ores. People, I can't even separate the laundry. Okay, ask my wife, she's right there. And here's the obvious point, folks. How many times do we read this and we don't get a clue what's really going on here? And how backwards society has it. According to the Bible, the pre-flood civilization was a glorious one. 
It was a high-tech one. These people weren't dumb apes dragging their knuckles on the ground. Are you kidding me? The Bible says these people were smart, man. Super smart, super intelligent, much more smarter and advanced than you and I could ever shake a stick at it, right? Isn't that what it said? And so for the scoffer folks, even for our own good, let's put it to the test. Let's ask the question. Because you got two things that don't agree here. Do we find any evidence of a, not just pre-flood civilization, but a highly advanced, super smart pre-flood civilization, just like the Bible says, or does evolution have it right? And were these people really dumb apes dragging their knuckles on the ground? Sean, I'm sorry to disappoint you, buddy, but uh, it's not evolution. (laughs) I'm nobody. What are you going to do? People, these people were so incredibly highly advanced. And the first evidence we have of a glorious, high-tech uh, pre-flood civilization, folks, is from the advanced technology that we find. People, what we are going to do today is, I've been waiting to get to this stuff. We are going to take a look at the actual archaeological remains. That totally blows away this stupid evolutionary idea that we were somehow at ever at any point. Some dumb ape-like creatures dragging their knuckles on the ground. Listen, in fact, when they come across these findings, here's their fancy, smancy scientific phrase. They call them anomalies. Ooh, huh? And you know what that is? That's their basic fancy, smanchy way of saying, hey, this doesn't fit our preconceived ideas of evolutionary origins of man. It messes it up. They call them anomalies, and they stick them away into a vault. I don't have time to go into this. One of the... i got to get my notes again. One of the guys, the researchers of this, I don't even know if the guy's even a Christian. He calls it the Smithsonian Gate. You know, like Watergate? You guys remember that scene there? Just give you a visual of what's going on. And he's, he's saying, this is what's happening to us, folks. They're deliberately suppressing the truth. If you guys recall there back in the day, the, the first Indiana Jones movie, and they got the ark and they put it in a crate, and then the guy wheeled it away with a bunch of crate, then the camera panned back, and you saw it was actually a big giant warehouse, and you go, whoa, what else are they hiding? He said, that's exactly what's going on. This is make-believe. It's not a picture. They are hiding this stuff from you and I because, folks, it supports the Bible. It has nothing to do with an anomaly. It supports the scripture. In fact, folks, here's what the the issue is going on. We're going to see with our own eyes. Just like the Bible says that mankind was smart, super duper smart right from the start. Highly advanced, highly technological. Let's take a look at some of the evidence. The first one is ancient computers is what they find. Let's check this out, folks. In 1901, an amazing artifact was recovered by sponge divers off a small island just northwest uh, of Crete. It turned out to be some sort of mechanism composed of many gears and wheels, and it had writing on the case. That's actually what it was. So they went a little bit further in the research. They did an x-ray of the mechani- uh, mechanism. There it is right there. And it showed to be much more complex. It contained a sophisticated system of differential gears that would have made it, listen, direct quote from the researchers, quote, the wonder of its age, the supercomputer of its day, which could do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. In fact, one French professor said this. He said, we are stunned at the ingenuity of the ancients. Uh, maybe it's because you think there were apes dragging their knuckles. And you're not listening to the Bible. Another professor of this, it does, listen to this, this is a a direct quote. It does raise the question, what else were they making at that time? It makes you wonder what they would have achieved if they would have carried on. Would they have had a man on the moon by 300 AD? That's how advanced this is. He says, it sounds ridiculous, but if they were able to construct something as technically brilliant as this, it's not complete fantasy. None of this, folks, as we are about to see today, makes no sense unless... You read your Bible. It makes perfect sense. Hey, how about ancient batteries? Today, batteries, folks, we can find them at just about any store. But apparently, they've been around for thousands of years. Several batteries known as the Baghdad batteries, check it out yourself, have been found in the ruins of a Parthian village. Check it out. There's a picture right there. The devices consist of a five and a half inch clay vessel with a copper cylinder inside held in place by asphalt. And inside that is an oxidized iron rod. Now, experts who examined it concluded that the devices needed only to be filled with an acid or alkaline to produce electricity. So, inquiring minds want to know, F.M. Gray of the GE High Voltage Laboratory decided to check it out. Here's what he found. He made some reproductions. There's one right there of the batteries. He filled them with electrolyte, like grape juice. That's all it takes. And sure enough, shocker, it produced electricity. Very interesting. And this prompted one researcher to state, quote, This requires the history books throughout the world to be rewritten. How about if you just read your Bible? You don't have to do any rewrite. I'll save you the time and the effort. Folks, this is a tip of the iceberg. How about ancient springs? Thousands of screw-like spiral objects as small. You talk about precision. Where's Doug? Engineer. One ten thousandth of an inch have been found and are still being found today by gold miners in the Ural Mountains of Russia. Uh, these metal items are found at depths, according to evolution, should be 20,000 years old or more. 
And as one person stated, contrary to what commentators believe, however, we don't think that these objects are extraterrestrial origin. Now that's a whole other camp that we need to take a little bit of time here to deal with. People oftentimes look at this, they go, well, obviously, evolution's wrong, so therefore it must be aliens! Aliens came and... Why do you always have to go somewhere else other than what the scripture has to say? It had nothing to do with aliens. Even the researchers are saying this is not extraterrestrial. We'll get to that in a second. But it was a highly advanced pre-flood civilization. Exactly what the Bible says. You don't have to go to that extreme. And that's what he says. He says, rather we think their origin is very terrestrial, i.e. here on earth. Quote, the vestiges of a former high-tech civilization, the evidence of which will be coming increasing apparent over the coming years. Unless Smithsonian Gate. Keeps doing what they're doing. But that's all. How about ancient spark plugs? While mineral hunting in the mountains of California in 1961, three men found a rock, among many others, that they thought was a geode that would make a good collection for their gym shop. Okay? Well, here's what happened. When they cut it open, they found, that's the actual picture there, they found an object inside that seemed to be made of a white porcelain-type material, and in the center of it was a shaft of a shiny metal, in case you could see there. The porcelain, they x-rayed it too, the porcelain material was surrounded by a hexagonal casing, and later an x-ray revealed a tiny spring at the end, just like like a modern day spark plug. What? And that's the question, Pastor Rich. The question is, how could a spark plug get in an object, according to evolution, that's supposed to be 500,000 years old? Something doesn't match up. But, but start putting two together and you start looking at it biblically, then this is the next question. Hey folks, if the ancient world could come up with computers and batteries and springs and even spark plug like objects, and maybe they'd come up with airplanes too. Sounds surprising, but folks, that's exactly what the evidence indicates. Let's take a look. In 1965, deep in the dense Colombian rainforest, a team of explorers made an intriguing discovery. Almost a thousand years ago, an ancient people known as the Kumbayan forged these beautiful brooches from gold and copper alloy. At first glance, they appear to be the models of small winged insects. But a second look reveals that there is something highly unusual about these objects. Their design carries anomalies found in no air-breathing creatures in the natural world. As we investigate further, we discover new, unexplained puzzles in the model's design. While all insects have their wings located on the top of their body, this ancient brooch has them at the bottom, a feature found only in modern jet aeroplanes. But there's more. Just like these jets, the brooches have delta-shaped wings. There is a rudder clearly shown and, quite astonishingly, ailerons. All of these features are found on modern aircraft like the Space Shuttle. This golden model has thus left a fascinating mystery. Could this be a model of an aircraft that actually existed? By constructing a 16 to 1 scale model of the artifact, he planned to unravel whether this stunning brooch was more like an insect or a supersonic modern airplane. The results are stunning. What was once dismissed as a piece of jewelry modeled as an insect actually flies more like a 21st century aircraft. We know about 20 of, of these similar artifacts and uh, they are something all the same shape. And uh, it was quite interesting, but we don't know the actual purpose of that. Peter Belting's pioneering research is causing us to reevaluate the accepted story of how mankind conquered the skies. But the true origins of the oldest flying machine may yet prove to be even earlier. In the Temple of Osiris in Egypt, a stunning, some say chilling, discovery was made that has ignited controversy in the scientific world. Inside the temple, the walls are encoded with hieroglyphics over 2,000 years old. Cut with incredible precision into the ancient rock, these images record the secrets of how generations of pharaohs lived and died. While Egyptologist Dr. Ruth Hover was photographing one of the wall panels, she made a startling discovery. There was a lot of rubble at my feet, and it looked to me like it had fallen off and incised in the stone itself of this oldest temple along the Nile. 
were these figures. I think the images are of ancient technology. They appear to duplicate technology that we now have. At the bottom appears to be a depiction of an aircraft with a clearly defined rudder. At the top is a shape clearly identified as a modern day helicopter. To the right of this is a streamlined water vessel below which is what appears to be a submarine. These simple images have ignited a fierce debate among Egyptologists and researchers. A debate that challenges all we thought we knew about the ancient Egyptians. Or how about all we thought we knew about the world? Explain that any other way, folks, common sense, than what the scripture says. These people back then, super duper smart. And we are being lied to. And that civilization was destroyed because they scoffed at God. And so went their technology. But let's, let's keep going, Ed. Let's, I mean, stop and think about it. I mean, how about ancient maps? I mean, if you're going to fly around the world, supposedly, in this ancient airplane, then you probably need a map, right? Well, hey, shocker, folks. That's exactly what they find. This is a recent one. Scientists have actually recently discovered, folks, a 3D aerial relief map on a giant slab of rock. It has become indisputable proof of an ancient high-tech civilization. Listen to this. This map is a real relief map, folks, just like what's used in today's modern military. It contains civil engineering works, a system of channels, listen, with a length of about 7,500 miles. I drove across America with my family. That's about two and a half times across America. I don't want to do that. That's a lot. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. It also contains on this map uh, several different sizes of dams, some of which are six miles long, almost two miles deep. And, and not far from the channels are these diamond-shaped grounds whose destination we don't know. Could be ancient cities and stuff. Then they found numerous inscriptions that at first they thought was a Chinese language, but it turned out to be a hieroglyphic syllabic language of some unknown origin. And in fact, one person, the more he studied the map, a professor stated, quote, the more I learn, the more I understand I know nothing. <laughs> it doesn't make sense unless you read your Bible. But that's it all. And because of this, this is why. Because the longer he said to think, the more complex it got. The more mysteries appeared on Listen, in order to create just the giant irrigation system that is depicted on this map, listen, they said these people had to move one quadrillion cubic meters of earth. Okay, and that prompted one researcher to say, quote, it makes anything modern man has accomplished look like a mere scratch. Today, we can only build a small portion of what's on this map. Hey, that's interesting. By the way, according to evolution, this map's supposed to be 120 million years old, Sean. I don't think so. Something doesn't match. Hey, how about ancient columns, folks? If you can see it or not, there's a guy right down there at the bottom for scale. Some columns, folks, are so that we find today are such an unbelievable size and weight. It is, but rivals anything that we modern man could ever hope to ever come up with and achieve. One of uh, such of them is called the monolith. It weighs over 2 million pounds. There's a guy sitting on top and one at the bottom. That's how big that uh, stone was cut, folks. In comparison, the largest stones used in the Great Pyramid was only 400,000 pounds. This baby is 2 million uh, uh, pounds, okay? And one person stated this. Listen, direct quote. Forget the ancient airplanes. Forget those ancient helicopters. The world, and forget the ancient, ancient world maps. Listen, this alone, this find, should set straight the standard line of primitive man to advanced man, then to civilization, scientific dogma on its ear. I.e., it's a bunch of baloney. There is no way this stone can be explained by science and the history that they teach us in school, and there is no historical records, although it is interesting to know, folks. The locals think this was part of the remains of a pre-flood city that was originally built by Cain after his banishment. <laughs> Come on, Kerry. Those are those wacky locals. I mean, yeah, they live there and stuff. But, I mean, what do they know? Folks, I don't know about you, but when you're dealing with the facts, it looks to me like, I'd say the Bible was right. There really was a highly advanced technological society before the flood, okay? <laughs> I mean, apes didn't do that stuff. There ain't no dragon knuckles on the ground. Are you kidding me? The Bible's right, folks. Once again, shocker that this was really a highly advanced, super smart people that unfortunately chose to scoff at God's warning. And we are finding their actual remains in the last days. But that's not all. The second evidence of a highly advanced, glorious pre-flood civilization is the ancient artifacts that we find. Ancient, common artifacts that we find in the civilization. Let's find out why. It's a logical conclusion. Here's what the scripture has to say. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 6 says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers are going to come. 
Okay, we've seen this many times before. Scoffing and following their own evil desires. And here's what they're going to say. Tell me this isn't familiar. Where is this coming he's promised? And Jesus coming back. You guys keep saying this. Blah, blah, blah. Right? Isn't that what people say today? Where's this coming he's promised? Ever since our fathers died, I don't see nothing. Blah, blah, blah. Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. There's no proof. But they what? Deliberately forget. Some translations willingly ignorant. That long ago, God's word, uh, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Here's the whole point. By these waters also, the world of what? Of that time was deluged and destroyed. Folks, according to our text, the Bible clearly says, listen, here's not the point. It's not just that scoffers would come in the last days. We've talked about that several times. It's not just that these scoffers would come and mock the return of Jesus Christ in the last days. We've talked about that several times. But it said there specifically this. Here's the point. They would be willingly ignorant of this fact, that there used to be a world in the past that has now since long been destroyed by the flood, right? Part two. Stop and think about it. In order for these people to be willingly ignorant of this, which means to purposely deny the evidence, then that means there must be some obvious evidence for them to deny. Right? If they're being willingly ignorant, they have to be doing this on purpose with obvious evidence, right? And so that's the question. Do we see any clear-cut evidence of a pre-flood world, including their artifacts? Uh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, folks, just like you would expect to find if there was a worldwide flood, these artifacts are encased in solid rock or solid coal, which was also formed at the time of the flood. Let's see why. Let's take a look. Coal appears in vast deposits scattered over the continents. It is typically thought that such deposits require many thousands to millions of years to form. Ten feet of plant material is needed to make one foot of coal. Evolutionary geologists teach that most coal deposits are basically a result of peat building up in swamps over millions of years. And since peat accumulates very slowly in modern swamps, long periods of accumulation would be required at modern rates. But forming coal this way has problems. For example, the top and bottom of coal seams are usually flat, and thin layers of mud are often found within coal seams. In the present world, however, roots of plants in the swamp break up the peat layers and mess up any mud layers which might form. Tree trunks especially penetrate the swamp peat, making it very uneven. Apparently, no modern process can explain how coal originated. The flood of the Bible, however, may provide an explanation. In the course of the flood, weeks of unceasing rains eroded away soil and plants, and rising seas and tidal waves destroyed the forests of the world. Some plants would be buried in place, some would be ground up and destroyed, most, however, probably floated atop the floodwaters until they became waterlogged and sank to the bottom. A continuous rain of sinking plants could produce the thick layers of plant material needed to form coal beds. Undisturbed by growing plants, such layers would have flat lower and upper surfaces, and in between could be undisturbed layers of mud. Bark rubbing off logs would explain coals made of bark, and vertical trees sinking would explain stumps sitting atop coal layers without penetrating them. Both have been observed at Mount St. Helens. The flood provides an explanation for the origin of coal, consistent with an earth only thousands of years old. The enormous coal reserves on our planet are a reminder and tribute to a beautiful and bountiful world now lost. How many of you guys remember in high school, you had that teacher with that science class? It was always great nap time when they put on that movie projector. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about the origins of coal. <laughs> Praise God you're still awake. Okay, so anyway, here's the whole point. 
<laughs> the reason why I'm sharing that is, hey, shocker, we're being lied about the origins of coal. Uh, yeah, shocker. Okay, but that's not my whole point in sharing the video about where coal actually came from. It's to get you to this point. It's logical, folks. Is this, if coal really did form, as the evidence seems to indicate, from a worldwide flood, from the swirling mass, can you imagine how many plants there were? The whole world completely wiped out? The, from, if coal really was formed at a worldwide flood from the swirling mass of plant remains, then logically you'd expect to find some of the pre-flood artifacts mixed in there as well, right? Wouldn't you think? Specifically in coal? Well, hey, thanks for that head nod. Uh, that's exactly what I find. Let's take a look at what we find in coal. Hey, folks, this is absolutely wild. How about metal cubes? Hey, folks, according to evolution, humans weren't even supposed to be around, supposedly, 65 million years ago. But that doesn't, let alone have the ability to work with metal. But that's right, Sean, that doesn't explain why metallic tubes have been dug out of supposed 65 million year old Cretaceous chalk in France. How'd those get there? And that doesn't explain also why, Jim, in 1885, a block of coal was broken up and out popped a metal cube that was obviously worked by intelligent hands. In fact, I didn't say that. The researchers said that. They said, obviously, intelligent humans date back much, much further than we realize. These examples should prompt any curious and open-minded scientist to re-examine and rethink the true history of life on Earth. Or it should prompt you to read your Bible. What is that doing in coal? That's the tip of the iceberg, folks. How about iron pots? That's the actual picture. In 1912, two employees of the municipal electrical uh, plant in Oklahoma came across a solid chunk of coal that was too large for the furnace. So they're guys, they're getting paid to do this stuff. What do they do? They break it open with a sledgehammer and out popped that iron pot. Right there, you can see with your own eyes. The coal was mined near Wilburton, Oklahoma, and according to evolution, should be 300 to 325 million years old. This is funny. Quote, the mystery of the iron pot has still not been solved. I'll solve it for you. How about a pre-flood world that was highly advanced of Genesis chapter 4? Hey, but that's still all, folks. How about pagan bells? Metal cubes, iron pots, man, that's not the only thing they find. Some of these pre-flood artifacts are exquisite, highly advanced, very decorative, too. Let's take a look. So then, what does the fossil record show? Have any pre-flood human artifacts ever been found? The answer seems to be yes. I found this bell in a lump of coal when I was a young person firing a furnace in West Virginia. Uh, I dropped a large lump of coal, and when it broke, there was something sticking out of it. In the next few months, I uh, abstracted this bell. The uh, bell is approximately seven inches, has a pagan god on top, and has an iron clapper, and uh, the bell works very well. And uh, over the uh, period of time, we found out that it is made of both uh, brass and bronze, plus uh, arsenic, sodium and uh, antimony, which uh, are not found in alloys that we have in the United States today. Historically, this pagan ceremonial bell is described very well by count in Genesis found in 422 that says that Tubalcane was an artificer of brass and iron. And so this quite likely is a pre-flood civilization uh, uh, object and could have been carried over by Noah's flood into the coal. Well, that just makes too much sense. But I'm sure he's just one of those wacky conservative Christians who are biased. I don't think so. That's still the tip of the iceberg. Hey, folks, how about decorative vases? A report in the June 1851 issue of Scientific American showed how two parts of a metal vase was dynamited out of solid rock. 15 feet below the surface in Massachusetts. Here's the actual picture of it. When the two parts were put together, they formed a bell-shaped vase that's four and a half inches high, six and a half inches at the base, two and a half inches at the bottom, and an eighth of an inch thick. The metal was composed of an alloy of zinc and a large portion of silver. As you can see on the sides, there were six flower bouquets inlaid with pure silver, and around the lower part was a vine or a wreath that was also inlaid with silver. In fact, one person stated, quote, the chasing, carving, and inlaying are exquisitely done by some unknown craftsman. We could solve that mystery too as well here in a second. It's a pre-flood guy. Oh, but that's not all, folks. Uh, by the way, according to evolution, the rock that this was uh, taken from was supposedly 100,000 years old. That doesn't jive, does it? Hey, how about uh, gold jewelry? In June 19, uh, 19, 1891, a Mrs. Culp of Morrisonville, uh, Illinois, was shoveling coal into her kitchen stove when a large lump broke in two and out popped a gold chain from the center. The chain was about 10 inches long, made of 8 karat gold, and was described as being, quote, of antique workmanship. The investigators were convinced that the chain had not been accidentally dropped in the coal, and the reason why is because one portion of the coal was still, hello, clinging to the chain, and two, the part that did separate from the coal, still bore the impressions of where the chain was 
encased in the coal, okay? It came directly from there. The problem is, according to evolution, this piece of coal is supposed to be 300 million years old. Something just ain't working with the evolutionary story. But that's all. Hey, put two and two together. Wait a second. This pre-flood world is going to do all this metal work, as you guys can see. Uh, you'd think they'd have some hammers lying around. You know what I'm saying? We'd find one somewhere. That's exactly what we find. Let's take a look at this hammer found in solid rock. Let's take a look. This ancient man-made hammer was originally found in June 1934 in central Texas near Volano Uplift. I took this artifact to Battelle Lab in Columbus, Ohio, the same lab that analyzed the moonstones. The elemental analysis shows that it is 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, and 2.6% chlorine. Physicists tell us that under atmospheric conditions today, you cannot compound chlorine with metallic iron. Yet, here it is. Research indications are that the pre-flood atmosphere is the only plausible explanation for the forging of this metallic composition. Due to the pre-flood conditions of Noah's day, this hammer was forged in the generation of Tubal Cain and Noah and deposited in the worldwide flood of Noah's day. Come on, you guys are just a bunch of wacko Christians. I mean, if there really was a worldwide flood, you would think we'd find some evidence somewhere. Come on, right, Lee? Well, shocker. We find tons of it all over the place. This stuff is just recently coming out, folks. I wonder why. Maybe God is being merciful to the scoffers who would come specifically in the last days. And folks, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Again, I invite you, you need to get my notes. They find coins, Ed, with an unknown language on them. They also find remains of utensils. They find dolls, little girls' dolls. They find statues. Listen, they even find tile floors. That's the tip of the iceberg. And here's my point. I thought this was interesting. Remember that coal video? Where coal really came from? Stop and think about it, folks. This is what we should be doing. Every time we burn a piece of coal, we need to acknowledge we are burning an actual piece of the evidence of a pre-flood civilization. Every time, if you will, we put in a shovel of coal into the furnace, we should be saying this, you should have listened to Noah. But no, you didn't want to listen to the warning. And now you're fuel. And so it is today. The Bible warned this, folks. It would come again. In the last days, just like with Noah's day, scoffers would come and be willingly ignorant, turn purposely from the evidence, even though it's all around us for all eyes to see. But that's not all the third evidence of a glorious high-tech pre-flood civilization is amazing migration. This is totally cool. Check this out. We don't only find evidence of their amazing pre-flood technology. We don't only find their artifacts. But just get this. Just like you'd expect to find if they had this amazing technology, these people are all over the planet. In fact, that's still all, folks. We find their actual cities still submerged underwater. Check this out. This is wild. Here these people were. Dan, check it. it, it, it horrible. Hor I don't even how do you, How do you describe this? And absolutely, these people were in a horrible, horrible existence that just seemed to tumble on forever and ever and ever. It, it was never ending, never slowing down. It was the same years and decades of torment, the, the regret, the sorrow, the pain, the, the blanketed darkness, the nights never ending, the constant consciousness, the, the lostness, the aloneness, the loneliness, the rumbling from the pit, the groans, the torturing fire, the choking smells, unending and unending. There was no letting up, there was no relief, there was no comfort, never resting, never ceasing, and no end in sight. 100 years rolled into another 100 years, slowly turned over to a 1,000 years, painstakingly evolved into another 1,000 years. And there's, it was the same grinding pain, the continual bone-racking agony, the screams upon screams, the weeping upon weeping, the echoing sighs upon sighs, when all of a sudden, they were out of there. It, it, it was gone. C could it be true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was! The pain, the agony, the torture, man, it was all gone. And now they were standing before this huge, massive white throne with, with tons and tons of books all around them. And there before them, people from all walks of life, uh, both young and old alike, were lined up in these huge, massive, giant lines. Why, it looked as if the whole history of humanity was represented here. That's because it was. 
And so suddenly the joy was replaced by fear as each person took their individual place before this throne. And suddenly the purpose of the books was realized. They contained every single dirty, rotten thing these people had ever done. Nobody left those books thinking they could ever enter heaven on their own. Are you kidding me? They fell horribly short, every last one of them. They had rejected the work of the Messiah and had instead trusted in their own works. And lest there be any doubt, the book that did contain the names who were also, who were going to heaven, who did trust the Messiah, that book was opened up. And sure enough, these people before the throne, their names cannot be found anywhere. And so it was. These people got instantly what they knew they justly deserved. They were now cast into the lake of fire forever. The book is Revelation. The judgment, of course, is the final judgment. The great white throne judgment. Folks, I don't know about you, but I would say rejecting the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and entrance into heaven and instead trusting in your own works to get you to heaven has got to be the deadliest thing somebody could ever do, right? I mean, folks, you talk about the ultimate rude awakening. I mean, this is not make-believe. I'm not making this up. Read Revelation for yourself, folks. That's really going to happen. One minute these people finally got out of hell. They got one moment of peace only to realize now you're going into the lake of fire forever. That's going to happen. That's what Jesus recorded for us. And so here's the obvious point. You would think that people would stand up and take notice <laughs> when God warns them about that future coming judgment, right? I mean, you would think that people would rightly conclude, hey man, I better get right with God so I don't suffer that coming judgment of God, right? But folks, once again, what in the world have we been seeing week after week? That is no longer the case. People in our world today, they're not just having a hard time believing in God. But if there's one thing that they have been trained, unfortunately, to scoff at, it's this future coming judgment of God. Yet it's all over the Bible, Old and New Testament, in the past and the future, and soon to come again. Therefore, folks, in order to help these people hopefully become smarter people, with all due respect, we're going to continue in our study. That's right, the witness of creation. The witness of creation. Folks, what we've been seeing is we're looking at five different evidences that God, out of mercy, I'm totally convinced. In these last days, this information was not available that long ago. We're looking at five different evidences, folks, that God is up behind for us, not just showing us he's real. Here's the whole point. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To establish some new religion on the planet? Are you kidding me? He endured the cross for the joy set before him. For a beautiful, intimate, bride-like relationship with his creation. That's what he came to do. That's what this is all about. And the first evidence that God has revealed this amazing truth was the evidence of an intelligent creation. The second evidence was the evidence of a young creation. The third evidence was the evidence of a special creation. And that's right, the last eight times, the fourth evidence, talk about merciful, was the evidence of a judge creation. And folks, what we have been seeing is, you talk about merciful, we've been seeing that there really was a worldwide flood. What was the flood about? What's the whole purpose of the flood? It was a time when God judged this world because of sin, not just because the Bible says so, but as we saw last time, because the evidence of a glorious civilization says so. And what we saw there was, folks, the evidence of an advanced technology and even the artifacts that we find all over the world that showed us, contrary to the lie of evolution, that there was never a time. There was never a time when mankind was a bunch of dumb, stupid apes dragging their knuckles on the ground living in caves. That's not what the evidence says, folks. The Bible is clear and the evidence was clear. It's not just that the scripture says so, but the evidence in archaeology says so. These people of Noah's days were absolutely smart, super smart, much more highly advanced and technological than you and I could ever shake a stick at. We still don't know how they did what they did. And yet somehow we're supposed to believe a lie that's been repeated loud enough, long enough, and often enough that we were still trying to figure out what makes fire work. We're being lied to, folks. And there's a reason why. The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of people. So they cannot hear the truth and believe and be saved. That's how wicked he is. He's seen, he knows his gig is up. He's seen how many people he can take down with him to hell. And he's using evolution to get it done. But that's not all. You talk about merciful. The third evidence of a glorious high-tech pre-flood civilization is the evidence of an amazing migration. We were never on this planet, folks, stuck in some isolated area in Mesopotamia, living in caves, drawing stuff on walls. Okay, there is a reason for that, but that's not the history of mankind. Are you kidding me? The Bible has a completely different picture. Mankind, from the get-go, had the ability to get all over the planet. 
But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Now, after the flood, I'll just give you a little bit of thing. We don't, I don't have this in my notes, but if you're wondering why we do find some certain elements of uh, crude utensils and uh, 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 weaponry and tools and some cave art, uh, for a portion in certain areas after the flood, after mankind sp- uh, spread out, stop and think about it logically, folks. You would have literally like a, a Gilligan's Island scenario, right? You have these people who have this ability and this technology, and we're going to see a lot of that got carried over and spread out through all of the world. But I'm certain there were certain elements of people who went their separate ways after the Tower of Babel that they had to basically, there was no Ace Hardware, there was no Home Depot. If you wanted a tool, you had to why? You had to build, it had nothing to do with becoming apes. You had to start all over. Okay, so that answers that. But we're going to see something diametrically opposed to that. They carried this technology with them. Genesis chapter 10, we're going to read verses 21 through 32. Now as we turn here to this passage, folks. I'm excited about this because as I was looking at it here, not only as we're going to see with this evidence for a glorious civilization, but I am firmly convinced that uh, unfortunately, uh, this is also a passage that people probably refrain from preaching on. And I think it'll be apparent here in a second. Let's take a look. Genesis chapter 10. We're going to read verses 21 through 32. And this is, of course, is the account, the genealogical account of Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Okay? And, of course, we're going to deal with the third one in our context here with the Semites who are from Shem. Okay? Let's take a look. Verse 21 says this. Now, sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Now, Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshech. Our fact said was the father of Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber. Now two sons were born to Eber. One's name was Peleg, because in his time the earth what? Divided, spread out. And his brother's name was Joktim. Now Joktim was the father of Almadad, Shelef, Hazramaveth, uh, Jerah, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obo, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktim. That's why people don't want to preach on this. <laughs> Praise God 27 times this week. I got her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, but if you know Hebrew, I probably slaughtered it. But anyway, that's right. Let's continue on. <laughs> Here's my whole point in sharing this one. Oh, here it is. The region, okay, that they lived stretched from Misha uh, to Safar in the eastern hill country. Now, here's the whole point. These are the sons, all of them. We just read Shem. These are all the sons of Shem by the clans and languages, their territories and nations. These are the clans of Noah's sons. All three accounts. We read just one of them. These are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within their nations. Listen, from these nations spread out what? Over the earth after the flood. It's a loaded statement right there, folks. According to our textbooks, the Bible clearly says that the descendants of Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, which is where all of humanity comes from, what they do. They didn't stick in one isolated area. They spread out over all the earth after the flood, right? And that's the key phrase. Notice it didn't say a section of the earth. Notice it didn't just say a small portion of the earth. It said what? They spread out literally all over the earth. And so that's the question. That's the problem. What does evolution say? They don't say that. They say this. They say mankind was locked into this tiny little area. And he was still locked in there trying to learn the elementary principles of fire and wheels. Right? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible clearly says, folks, that right after the flood, mankind had the ability to spread out over all the earth right after the flood. And so you would expect to find, then, if that's true, you'd find some evidence of their journeys all over the earth after the flood. Right? Well, hey, Joan, thanks for asking. It works well with my notes. That's exactly what we find, folks. Let's take a look. How about the evidence of coins? There was never a time, folks, when we were a bunch of dumb apes living in caves, isolated. We were all over the planet. How about some coins? Folks, Roman coins have been found in Venezuela, Maine, and even in Texas at the bottom of an Indian mound. What's that doing there? Excuse me? I thought we were stuck in a tiny... Whatever. In 1957, a boy found a coin in a field in Alabama that was from Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily, dating back to 490 B.C. What is that doing in... Alabama. How about in the summer of 1882, a miner of British Columbia, which if you know your geography is just north of Washington State, just south of, Dan can confer, give it up for Canada, <laughs> south of Alaska. This is where this was at, folks. They found 30 Chinese coins 25 feet below the surface that were older than 2000 BC. 
What's that doing there? Excuse me? While seeking a fence at a depth of about two feet, a bronze coin was discovered by this Mr. Andrew Henderson near Burn Falls, Australia, 1910. Listen to this. The coin was positively identified as Egyptian, having been minted during the reign of Pharaoh Ptolemy IV around 200 BC in Australia. What's that doing there? In Gordonville, Australia, speaking of which, a second bronze coin was dug up that later was identified as a Greek coin minted around 28 BC. Must have been a popular travel site or something. I don't know. Hey, how about pottery? Hey, folks, Roman pottery has been unearthed in Mexico that, according to its style, is about from the second century AD. What's that doing in Mexico? You think you like the Mexican food, Ed? Hey, that'd take me there. But let's continue on. How about inscriptions? This is wild. The Kensington Stone, folks, discovered in, shocker, Kensington, Minnesota, in 1898 contains inscriptions describing an expedition of the Norsemen. That's right, Vikings. You wonder where they get the name. Of Norsemen into the interior of what is now North America in that area, okay, Minnesota. And the problem is that it's estimated that this expedition took place in the 1300s. Gary, that was before Brett Favre showed up. In case you're wondering. Barely, I know barely, but it won't go there. That's right, he's doing a good job. Let's continue on. The fifth size stone uh, was found in Nashville, Tennessee, folks, in the cemetery in the 1890s. The front of it was inscribed with Libyan symbols that were from about pre-100 AD. Listen to this. The inscription reads, The colonists pledge to redeem. I don't know, I'm kind of reading between the lines. Maybe the guys got there and they got in a fight and they lost. Oh yeah, we're going to come back and get you. What are they doing over there in Tennessee? That's very interesting. Near Rio de Janeiro. Folks, that's South America, for those of you hooked on geography. High on a vertical rock wall, 3,000 feet up, is an inscription that reads this. Tyre, Phoenicia, Batazar, firstborn of Jeff Baal. And it's dated to the middle of the 9th century BC in South America. What's that doing over there? A mysterious rock inscription was found by a farmer in 1931, uh, 50 miles west of Adelaide, Australia. The carvings were identified as Phoenician by French archaeologists. And it reads this. Listen. Men of the pharaoh of the city of Sais, Ot of Kish. As it turns out, folks, Kish was an ancient Babylonian town on the Euphrates and was the birthplace of this guy named Ot, who was considered the greatest Babylonian mariner of the day. Apparently he did live up to his legend. He made it all the way down to Australia. Near uh, Parahaiba, Brazil, South America again, folks, an ancient uh, an inscription, Phoenician, uh, reads, and it, it, listen to what it says. We are the sons of Canaan from Sidon. The city of the king. Commerce has cast us on this distant shore, a land of mountains. We set, literally, sacrificed a youth for the exalted gods and goddesses in the 19th year of Hiram, our mighty king. We embarked from Ezengeber into the Red Sea and voyaged with 10 ships. We were at sea together for two years around the land belonging to Ham or Africa, but we were separated by a storm and we were no longer with our companions. Listen to this. So we have come here, uh, 12 men and three women on a shore which I, the admiral, control. Like, dude, you got lost. <laughs> but that's right, you're going to control it. Still won't admit he got lost. Anyway, whatever. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> how about those pictures? You know what I'm talking about, Ed. Anyway, a botanist has identified plants in an ancient fresco that has a pineapple, as you can see, and a specific species of squash that's only native to the Americas. The problem is, folks, this fresco was in the Roman city of Pompeii. How do they know about that fruit unless they ate it and could draw it? That's interesting. How about ships? 1886, the remains of a shipwreck was found in Galveston Bay in Texas. The problem was the ship was constructed in typical Roman style. What's a Roman ship doing in Texas? North of Cooktown, Australia, strange aboriginal carvings have been found depicting ships not of European descent, folks, but of Egyptian descent, bearing the symbol of the Egyptian sun god. And speaking of which, Wollongong, Australia, there's a wreckage of an ancient wooden ship that's similar to two others found in Swampland in Perth, Australia, and they're all believed to be also Egyptian as well. How about artifacts? A doll was made of wood and wax was found in a well of sacrifice at I'm not going to say it. it sounds too much like chicken. Uh, it's a place in Mexico. Okay. And uh, on this doll the problem was folks in this well of sacrifice possibly where they sacrificed people it wasn't just a doll was there but on this doll was Roman writing that they found in Mexico. That's pretty interesting. How about uh, some more artifacts? At Uladula, these guys got some cool names down there. You know what I'm saying? Wollongong, Uladula. In Australia, was found a 2,000-year-old Chinese stone head that depicted a Chinese goddess. What's that doing in Australia? In 1910, uh, people digging another well uh, in Cairns, Cairns, however you say that, Australia, found an Egyptian scare beetle six and a half feet below the surface. It was three and a half inches long and had hieroglyphics carved all underneath. What's that doing in the dirt there? I'll speak of which during the 1920s, bushwalkers in North Australia found a stone Peruvian idol. 
Hello, South America again. What are they doing there? Japanese steel blades have been found in Alaska, and their pottery is also found even in Ecuador. But that's still all. How about fossils? In 1982, archaeologists digging at Fayum, which is near Siwa Oasis in Egypt, uncovered fossils of kangaroos and other Australian marsupials. What are kangaroos doing in Egypt? Sounds like somebody got around, uh, if you ask me. How about languages? An ancient Chinese book that was written about 338 BC mentions a great southern continent inhabited by fierce black people who used a strange weapon, which we now know is the boomerang. How did they know about that stuff? How about statues? 1974, a 92-pound basalt rock was unearthed from a building site in Australia while they were digging out foundations for a factory. Voila, you find something. And here's what they found. The rock was carved with a solar motif, a stylistic face, and hieroglyphs of serpents. It was later identified belonging to an ancient Mesoamerican, South America, culture around 2000 BC. They dug it up there. In the foundations. That's interesting. How about 1914? Archaeologists was excavating on the other side. Now in South America, Mayan ruins in the city of wherever Mexico, and they discovered two statuettes that were clearly Egyptian folks. One was male, one was female, complete with ancient Egyptian dress and engravings. Buried in Mayan ruins. It's almost like they had connections with each culture. Very interesting. Hey, and finally, the Olmec folks are thought to have been the first civilized people, uh, so they say, of South America, dating around 1400 BC. Yet one of the mysteries that they've left us, folks, check this out, this is really wild, uh, are these giant carved heads wearing helmets. You can see one there, about the size there. Uh, all are carved from a single piece of granite and are as tall as six feet, uh, five inches high, they weigh about 20 tons. The problem is the faces clearly depict African features. How do they know what people from Africa look like? To be able to, let alone carve that. That's interesting. That's still in all. Historians tell us that's the problem, that Africans didn't come to the Americas until the time of Columbus. Stranger still, though, as you can see one of them down in the bottom corner there, uh, on the right there, are numerous white people features that have also been unearthed. It's like Europeans made it over there. Hey, don't the uh, Mexicans, the cultures, many of them have uh, uh, legends about white people who would come, and, and that's what the Spanish people used to get their foot in the door with them, and about the legend of the white man who would come and how would they know about a white guy? And that's the question, folks. The question is, what is an advanced black and even possibly white pre-Hispanic civilization doing in the Americas prior to and even more advanced than the Maya and the Aztecs? Where do they come from? No one knows why, folks, where they came from or where they went to or how in the world they moved these huge stones from distant quarries. Quote, traditional archaeology does not have the answers. Yet if you believe that man has always been advanced, like the Bible says, you can easily see where they came from. In fact, one person stated this direct quote. Evolutionists want so much to show a steady, inevitable progression from caveman to advancing man. But Bible believers understand that man has been building cities right from the start. You know, it's almost, Jim, like you could trust every page of the Bible. Folks, I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty evidence. I mean, the surprise, surprise. The Bible has it right again. Shocker. Folks, when are we going to wake up and stop backing up like we got to be scared? Like, oh no, they got me now. This whole evolutionary thing is totally bankrupt. If you're honest with the facts, mankind was never isolated in some tiny little area learning about fire and wheels. Dragging their knuckles on the ground. Are you kidding me? What did we just see? Not just because the Bible says so. What did we see because of the evidence of archaeology says so? What's it reveal? That mankind was highly advanced right from the start and had the ability to spread out over all the earth. Exactly like the Bible says. We don't need to shrink back at all. They're the ones who are lying, not the word of God. But that's you know, the fourth evidence of a high-tech pre-flood civilization. Totally glorious, folks, is the astounding underwater cities. I saved this for last on purpose. You see, you might be out there thinking, okay, fine, Pastor Billy. So, so apparently there really was a pre-flood world that was made up of these highly advanced people. And we still don't even know how they did what they did. And we're actually reinventing what they had invented long ago. Okay, I'll give you that one. And yes, contrary to evolution, apparently the post-flood people were able to travel all over the planet exactly like the Bible says. Okay, I'll give you that one, but come on. If there really was this glorious civilization that existed prior to the flood, that got totally destroyed by the flood, then gee whiz, you would think we'd find at least a few of their settlements somewhere underwater, right? Well, thanks for that scuffing question, Monty. We do. Atlantis, eat your heart out. What you guys are going to see, folks, it isn't just one little city that's supposedly a myth that people say was submerged by a flood. 
They find these cities all over the earth. It's not just one spot. How about we'll start with America? Folks, get this. Why, how come this wasn't on the news? In January 1967, the Illuminati, the world's deepest diving submarine at that time, discovered an undersea road off the coasts of Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina going up that way. And the, listen to this. The road extended to depths of 3,000 feet and was paved with a layer of magnesium oxide. Arthur L. Market, the owner of the sub, reported that the currents kept the road swept clean, quote, so that it looked just like a blacktop. In fact, get this, folks, so much so that they attached wheels to the Illuminati and it rolled right along that road perfectly fine. One person stated this, direct quote, this is wild. What technology could build a long blacktop paved road for hundreds of miles that was still in good condition many thousands of years later? We need the, that technology around here in Buffalo. Have you noticed that? I mean, that stuff, the potholes don't even make it one winter. I've noticed that. It's still there, still good, still uh, underwater even? Who did that? Hmm, interesting. How about the Atlantic? Let's continue around the world. 1966, during a research expedition led by a Dr. Robert uh, J. Menzies of Duke University, they photographed what appeared to be carved rock columns 6,000 feet under the ocean in what's called the Milne Edward Deep. Dr. Menzies admitted that the discovery of this may indeed be the ruins of an ancient city. And very well could be, direct quote, one of the most exciting discoveries of this century. Some of the columns were half buried in mud while others were standing upright. Many of them appeared to have some kind of writing on them. But that's not all. Another one in the Atlantic was reported by a salvage crew aboard the ship Talia from Spain. Check this out, folks. They actually videotaped miles of pillared temples, buildings, and statues with wide curving boulevards with smaller avenues branching out from the center like spokes in a wheel. Where did that come from? How about Cuba? This is wild. This is really recent. Evidence of an ancient city was recently found one half mile down off the coast of Cuba thanks to a team of, that's right, Dan, it's your time to shine, uh, Canadian and Cuban researchers. Okay? They not only found structures like those at Stonehenge and Easter Island. Listen to this. This was wild. Some of the structures were over 1,300 feet wide, over 130 feet high. Some of them were sitting on top of each other. And they all show very distinct shapes and symmetrical designs of a non-natural kind. In fact, one of the anthropologists said that the photos, the still photos from the videos clearly show, quote, symbols and inscriptions, but it's not yet known what language the inscriptions are written in. And this caused one of the researchers to state, listen to this direct quote, folks. It is stunning. What we see in our high resolution sonar images are limitless rolling white sands. And in the middle of this beautiful white sand under the ocean... There are clear, man-made, large-sized architectural designs. Listen, drug quote. It looks like when you fly over an urban development in a plane and you see highways and tunnels and buildings. Underwater. Oh, that's pretty interesting. The problem is, folks, if the dating proves accurate, it would mean that the ancient civilization, this one, had designed and erected these vast stone structures long before the wheel was invented in Samaria and the sundial in Egypt, or should we say reinvented in Samaria. And in Egypt. Shocker. But that's not all. Researchers also think the city is much larger than what their projections initially show. They think it might extend for many, many more miles. That's pretty wild. Almost as wild as this one. How about India? Folks, it's all over the world. It's not just one spot. Recently, there was an underwater find near India that could actually, quote, rewrite history. Local fishermen in that area have for centuries believed that a great flood consumed a city in a single day. But nobody believed them. Shocker. Scoffers would come. Until one guy, this is him right here, Graham Hancock. You'll see a video of him, Lord willing, in a second. Finally took him serious. And so he and a team decided to go check it out. And what they found was an extensive area of structures that were clearly man-made. In fact, the scale of the submerged ruins covers several square miles and are as spectacular as the ruined cities, their own quote, submerged off of Alexandria and Egypt. The problem is if the dates hold true, it would totally upset previous archaeological opinion because they don't recognize... Any culture in India capable of building anything like that during this time. Remember, we're supposed to be back in caves dragging our knuckles. That kind of ruined that theory. And it prompted one person to state this. It's like he's throwing a tantrum. There's a huge problem with this chronological uh, problem in this discovery. It means that the whole model of the origins of civilization with which archaeologists have been working will have to be remade from scratch. <laughs> Can you almost hear it? <laughs> it's like, yeah. How about that? Why don't you? But they won't. And you'll see that here in a second. And that's why Hancock himself, folks, as far as I know, he's not a Christian, himself says scientists should be more open-minded. He said, quote, I have argued for many years that the world's flood myths deserve to be taken seriously, a view that most Western academics reject. But here we have proved the myths right and the academics wrong, which means they're not myths anymore, are they? They're factual information, like the Bible says. 
Oh, but that's not all, folks. One more. How about the most, one of the most amazing, obvious, and very recent finds is uh, from the effects of Noah's flood is right off the coast of Japan. This one you have to see with your own eyes. Let's take a look at the video. The sapphire blue salt water of the East China Sea holds a bounty of natural wonders for those who come here. This undersea world has rarely been seen by people outside the tiny Japanese diving community that claims this part of the ocean for their own. In 1987, scuba instructor Kihachiro Aratake sets out to find ways to attract more divers to Yonaguni. But what Aratake discovers instead is even more unique, even more spectacular than anything he could have possibly imagined. When I first saw it, I had goosebumps and felt strange, wondering why something like this exists underwater. To Aratake, the stone megaliths he discovers look like the remnants of an ancient ceremonial structure. Masaaki Kimura is a professor of physical sciences at the University of the Ryukyus in Okinawa, Japan. In 1992, he is the first scientist to explore and measure the underwater phenomenon. This the body, yes. The main structure is over 500 feet long, almost the length of two football fields, and taller than an eight-story building. To Kimura and his team, this is more than a collection of interesting rocks. Our studies show proof that the monument is not artificial, but is man-made. But Kimura's studies, published in Japanese and circulated only within his own academic community, fail to reach the West. Photographs are circulated on the World Wide Web where they attract the attention of Western divers. Among the first on the scene are husband and wife team Gary and Cecilia Hagland, underwater photographers who have made more than 9,000 dives around the world. The first time that we dove on the monument, it just seemed like I was in some sort of a science fiction movie flying across uh, some city, this massive, massive city. And when I got back up on the boat, I just, I, was, I had no words to describe it. The photographs of the monument also impress Graham Hancock, a former correspondent for The Economist and author of a series of books on Earth's oldest known structures. Hancock immediately takes a crash course in scuba diving so he can see the monument for himself. My first impressions when I first saw the main uh, underwater structure at, at uh, Yonaguni were of, of complete awe. To see very clean, almost right-angled, sharp edges, to see every appearance of design and uh, organization in a large stone structure underwater uh, ra raised in me a, a tremendous sense of excitement and mystery. The closest parallel, I would say, is the kind of feeling that, uh, that I get when I walk into a great cathedral or uh, into the great pyramid of, of, of Egypt. I was following Eritaki very closely as he pointed out the different features and he was motioning at his, at his eyes and then pointing to this perfectly carved out area in the rock. I, I thought he meant, come look at this, so I, I came in closer with the camera and I realized, oh, He's saying these are eyes, they're eyes. But I was so close I couldn't really see this. So as I, as I swam back with the camera, all of a sudden it just like materializes. There, carved in the side of this stage, is a perfect face. There's no doubt in my mind that this is man-made. There's just absolutely no way that this could just happen to be here. When I look at those faces, those brooding faces, uh, instead of Egypt, I think more of what you see in Central America, especially some of the, the Mayan uh, stone sculpture. And then along the side, another enormous image. It looked like some sort of a headdress or uh, bird wings coming off of the face, carved in the stone itself. And nobody that I know of has mentioned that to date. There are also niches in the rock that some believe could be petroglyphs. It really needs to be studied because there's more here than, than folks know. 
and I think this is going to just really rewrite the history books. To date, no such study is planned. According to experts, around 8,000 B.C., we were primarily hunter-gatherers, nomadic, unorganized clans who had only the most rudimentary stone tools. Certainly not the kind of society capable of creating the Yonaguni monument. The question of considering a phenomenon like a series of submerged anomalous structures off the coast of a Japanese island uh, and, and the fact that very few academics have been prepared to spend even a minute of their time looking into that, to, to me this is a huge failure of science in, in, in the world today. It's very important to remember that there are a large number large numbers of ancient traditions that refer to a lost civilization destroyed by a flood. Not even a minute of their time. And I quote, to date, no such study is planned. Hmm, I wonder why. But how much more proof, folks, do we need before we will stop running scared like evil chickens from evolution? I don't care if it's in the educational system. I don't care if it's in the movies or Hollywoods or universities. We're dealing with the facts. We believe what we believe, not just because the Bible says so. Hello, that's the primary one. But if, exactly like you'd expect if it was true, and it is, everything else should line up, and it does. It's evolution, folks, that is totally bankrupt. Here's my whole point, church. When in the world are we going to wake up and realize... And just listen what this scripture has to say. This is not a book of myths. This is not a book just to teach us some good moral truths. This book, the scripture, is a complete, accurate recording of the whole human history. There was never, ever a time when mankind was a bunch of dumb, stupid apes dragging their knuckles on the ground, living in caves. Are you kidding me? The evidence in the Bible is clear, folks. We just saw the last two weeks the evidence of an advanced technology, ancient artifacts, an amazing migration, and we just saw their underwater city still there. What more does God have to do? Before we'll just listen to what he says. Folks, it's obvious there really was a glorious, high-tech, pre-flood civilization. Listen. That was destroyed. Why? Because they scoffed at Noah. They scoffed at the word of God. And so it is today. And so it is being repeated all around us. And so I ask you. You going to do the same thing? Their society was high, highly advanced just like ours today. Don't kid yourself. They were able to build amazing structures. They were able to transport themselves all over the earth. Just like today. And here comes this Noah guy. You better get in this boat. And me and my family's building. Because we got a word from God. Judgment is coming. But he's merciful. And if you would just come. You could be saved. It's just like it was in Noah's day. And so are you too. Going to scoff. People I can only beg you. Just like Noah must have done. Will you please stop being a scoffer. And would you please take God up on his gracious offer to get into the boat of Jesus Christ before it's too late. The scripture is clear. You don't want to be here when the next judgment begins. And it will come when you least expect it. But by then it's going to be too late. There was only one way out before. There's only one way out now. Please accept God's gracious offer. Let's pray. Thank you for watching this presentation from Niagara Frontier Bible Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 5287 Bronson Drive, Lewiston, New York, 14092, or you can give us a call at 716-297-8783, or for email, office at niagarafrontierbible.com, or you can visit our website at www.niagarafrontierbible.com.